You just said, I'm just now. I would I argue that all bets are off. I even have a thing Oh, yippee. <laughs> Number six. Way to go. Four positive charges, 4Q, 3Q, 2Q, and Q are placed clockwise in a square starting from the upper left-hand corner. What is the size and direction of the force on the charge of Q? Of 4Q? That is all. That is my question. You said to speak it clearly. I don't understand. Just speak it again. It was nearly in another language. <laughs> Um, Q, 2Q, 3Q, 4Q. Is that good? Okay. And we want the charge on the upper right-hand corner's charge, correct? The force. The force, okay. Uh, side length, did they give us something to use here? No, I just put an X. Okay, so side length is X. Uh, I think there are three forces acting on charge Q. Would you agree? I have one force acting, and I'm going to define upwards as the, just to screw with you guys, um, the J hat direction. Because I know you've learned IJK notation. And if not, well, no better time than the present. How many of you have, known, have been taught IJK notation? Don't really know why it exists since there exists X, Y, and Z notation. But if, if I tell you that I, J, K notation has very close similarities to X, Y, Z notation, will that be enough for you to understand? Oh, good. Uh, the size of this force is going to be uh, 2 Q squared K over X squared. Any question about that? All right. Um, that's in a, not a particularly nice spot, so let's move that over there. And let's consider, oh, I'm sorry. That's not two, that's four. Even though you guys said yes, that would be fine. It would not be fine. It's got to be four, because it's the force between these two. We okay with that? All right. Don't really care whether you're okay with it or not, but I'm moving on anyways. Um, there is a force in this direction, which I will say is the I-hat direction. And it is of the size of 2Q squared K over X squared. This is the force between these two particles. Okay. All good so far? Well, we're going to have a force in this direction. Luckily, I know it's at a 45 degree angle to I hat and J hat. So there will be equal contributions to both the I-hat direction and the J-hat direction from this particular force because it's at a 45 degree angle, but it's not in the I-hat direction or the J-hat direction, right? It's at an angle. So we'll have to deal with that, but let's first deal with the size of that force. It's gotta be three Q squared K over X squared. Are we all okay with that? Owen's not. When Owen has a question. Would it not be X squared? across the middle. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would interrupt why that's a problem. What should it be? X squared root of 2. X squared of 2 squared, making it yeah. 2x squared. There we go. Now we're good. Now, do I need to explain that to anybody? You won't hurt my feelings. You'll just come up to me later, and that will aggravate me when you say, why is it that, Mr. Shelton? I don't get it. Thank you. That is better for me than have somebody out there who is not. Oh, I don't want to do that. So this distance, I'm going to use this one because it is easier for you to see rather than me draw out the other one. Um, that distance has to come from Pythagoras. And that would have to be x squared plus x squared to the 1 half power making it root of 2x. 
then I square that to get 2x squared. Okay. From this point forward, if you don't know this, put it in there. The diagonal of any square is root of 2 times the side length. Just memorize it. It comes up so frequently. We have so many things that have a square symmetry to them. Just memorize it. Don't work it out every time. Do you have time on a 15-minute FRQ to work this out? You really don't. So, come on, root of 2 is 1.4. It's going to be bigger than the side length. Just, just do it, please. All right. Um, this particular picture is not ideal for what I would like to, to do next, but these are the three forces, and I need to do a vector sum which means I have to add up the components in each direction. So I'm going to add up all the components in the i direction and all the components in the j direction, and then I'll use the Pythagorean theorem and tangent to get the size and direction of the net force. Are we good with that? Do we understand that? So I'm going to create a new... Um, well, that was probably doing this stuff. That was physics, right? Got to use Coulomb's law. And um, sure. And I, I want to be a little bit careful about this one because I want it to be um, useful for us and maybe to scale a bit. And I'm spending extra time on this one for the folks who are joining us from AP Physics 1 who may not have had the kind of uh, the length of, of or, or depth of trig that we did in mechanics. So this one, this way, is the one that's in the i-hat direction, and it is the one that is uh, two units long. Now I'm going to say that because, remember, we have 2 q squared k over x squared, 3 q squared k over 2 x squared, and 4 q squared k over x squared. I'm going to ignore the q squared k over x squared right now, right? They're all got q squared k over x squared in them. So for their size, I'm going to say that this is two units long, and a unit is q squared k over x squared. That means there's one this direction. Well, it's going to be shorter than that, smaller than two, three halves. That is three halves long. And one in this direction, that is four units long. We good so far? All right, I hat, J hat, I made myself a little chart. This is gonna be the, we'll talk about the two vector first. The two vector is in the positive I direction and has no component in the J direction. And might as well do the other low hanging fruit, we have one with zero in the I direction, but four in the J direction. Then three halves. Three halves has to be broken up into each direction, which means I have to multiply by the cosine and the sine of 45 degrees. I have to find the two components. Luckily, the cosine and sine of, of 45 degrees are the same, and they are one over the square root of two, or square root of two over two. So that means that this is going to be 3 root 2 over 4, and 3 root 2 over 4. We good? I'll just multiply by square root 2 over 2. All right, well, um, if you remember your vector notation from last year, we add down the columns in each vector. Now, it's at this point where I really don't care if we keep it in terms of the root of 2. You could rationalize that if you want, turn it into a decimal. I mean, that will be okay. In fact, let's do that. 1.41 times 3 divided by 4. What? Nobody's hurriedly calculating this, not even Owen, who is desperate to see how this problem works. 1.06. Thank you. So... One point zero six, one point zero six. So net force is three point zero six I hat plus five point zero six J hat. This is not the answer, because all of this actually has to be multiplied by Q squared K over X squared. 
Thou it's a force. But this doesn't answer the question. The question that was asked was what is the net force and direction? So that means my actual force. And look, it's been a long time since a lot of you guys have probably done this vector addition stuff. This one was relatively okay. It wasn't terrible. But it looks like I go out 3.06 units in the I direction and up, bless you, 5.06 units in the Y direction. So my resulting vector, resulting vector is this way. I need to find the size of that vector. I don't know what that is, but you could figure it out. You are smartish people. Nine plus 25 is 34. Root of 34 is gonna be a little bit less than six. Something is like 5.5. 5.91, great. I need this angle. Best way to get it, tangent. Tangent of that angle is gonna be 5.06 divided by 3.06. You get that hardly any of this is physics, right? And this is a lot of trig, but some of physics is trig. Adding vectors together, that's, that's a trig uh, physics thing. So what do we got here? Better than 45, but I don't know how by much. I don't know, don't care. What's that? 58.83. All right, so we have found the direction 58.83 degrees from the positive x direction, or whatever you want to call that, positive i direction. And we have found the size of the force. The size of the force, the net force, is 5.91 q squared k over x squared. Size and direction of the net force acting in charge. It was not a terribly difficult problem, but not easy. But the physics part? Probably, you would argue that adding these vectorially to get the net force is a physics tenant, but not a particularly interesting one, but necessary. Uh, to go back to the days when everybody had an HP calculator and not a TI calculator, because the AP calculator, I'm sorry, the HP calculators did vector addition internally as a function. You could just put in the vectors and it would give you the angle and lengths. It's pretty nice. They don't put that in the TIs, but they should. Yeah. I like RPN notation much better than I like regular notation. Yes, sir. You know what all the rules were, and you already opened up with an uh, and you know that I can't hear your voice from way back there, so you need to project from the diaphragm there. Can you uh, hit me up with those uh, those values again? Point three meters apart. Do you need help with the first part to find the force? So we're talking about the second part. Okay. So these, if it says conducing spheres, then I've spelled it wrong. It should be conducting spheres. You also said and, instead of yeah, I make mistakes. Hope you don't, because it's your test. I have tenure. They're not going to fire me. Um, if, I, if I connect these with a conducting cable, and I want to be very clear about this, um, we did not talk about this. You can be forgiven for not knowing what happens next. It was on my radar to discuss. We just didn't get to it yet. But I think this won't be too difficult for you to understand. Um, all the charges on both spheres are trying to spread out, right? They're all repelling each other. 
and this might be worth writing into your notes, this next thing. Conductors and insulators are different types of materials. We will be going into them at length throughout the course of the year. But a conductor doesn't necessarily allow charge to stay where it's placed. In a conductor, uh, free charges are able to move around freely throughout the material. Now what that means in practice is that charges will spread out on a conductor until they are uniformly distributed. Now, in your notes, circle that statement and write right below it, Mr. Shelton is lying because it's now now lie. I'm telling you this lie because we will have to fix this later. It's going to work for this problem. But it's not exactly true. It's true in this problem because they told us they are conducting spheres. In real life, if the shape isn't a sphere, they will spread out until the electric potential on the surface is the same number. But you don't know what electric potential is right now, so I don't really think I can explain it that way to you. So for right now, they spread out uniformly. But understand, that's only because they're spheres. We good so far? All right. Now, an insulator is different. If you place a charge on one side of an insulator, then that charge stays on that side of the insulator. It doesn't spread out. That's why you wrap wire in insulation so that the charges passing through the wire, the conductor, aren't free to go into you when you grab the wire. There's an insulator on the outside of it to protect you from the charges inside. Good so far? All right. Now, here's the thing. If I connect a conducting cable, well, I bet the forces on the individual charges on the 18 nanocoulomb sphere are pushing each other apart harder than the forces on the 12 nanocoulomb worth of charge on the other sphere. Right? Because the spheres are the same size. There's more charge concentrated on the 18 nanocoulomb, and it's pushing harder to get them apart than on the 12 nanocoulomb. Does that make sense so far? Now, this isn't a full explanation of what happens, but it gets us close. Charges are going to move across that wire until the forces acting to separate them are equal, meaning there's the same amount of force acting to separate both. So when will that happen? Well, I'm thinking it'll happen when both charges have 15 nanocoulombs of charge. Right, there's a total charge of 30 nanocoulombs. So charges will flow and redistribute until half is on one sphere and half is on the other. Because then the forces on the particles will be the same. Does that make sense? So that's what happens. In this particular problem, the way it's described, the charges will flow until both spheres have 15 nanocoulombs of charge. Now, it's still repelling. So they're still positive. And you can still find out what that force is of repulsion. But they didn't ask about the force of repulsion. They asked for the tension in the cable. But that's really just a, that's really just a trick, right? The tension in the cable has to be the same as the force on one of the charges to hold the two charges in place. So I'm going to repeat the problem, 15 times 10 to the negative ninth, times 15 times 10 to the negative ninth, times k, divided by 0.3 squared. This has got to be the size of the tension force in the cable, because it's the size of the force trying to push the two charges apart. And if I'm even going to include it, why isn't it twice the size? So, way back when you were youngins, we had problems that looked like this. Uh, oh, yeah.
talking about? These are so stupid easy. Okay. All right. Do you remember these? Okay. If this is M and this is M, I know even right now there are some of you who think that there's two MG worth of tension in the cable. But there can't be. If I tell you that the system is at rest and is in stable equilibrium, and I add that the pulleys themselves are nearly massless, which actually doesn't matter if it's stable equilibrium, but I'm saying it all just to get all the things right. The net force on the right weight has to be zero. And how many forces are acting on it? Two. Two. One of them has got to be tension upwards, and one of them has to be weight downwards, which means the tension in the cable has to be equal to weight. Well, that's the tension in the whole cable. So even the tension here is just mg, not 2 mg. Same argument can be made here, right? There's a force this way and a tension this way. They have to be equal for that force to stay in place. So for the same reason, the tension would equal just the force that's pushing them apart. There is this desire to say the tension is greater than this, but it's, it's born out of a misunderstanding. If you recall, one of the things I did last year is I would have said, how is this problem different? If I just get that out of the way and say that the table has like a, a wall affixed to it that's just, I tie the string to, right? system still stays at rest and the tension in the cable is still the weight. Part of what that weight hanging off the edge is doing is maintaining the state of equilibrium. That's what it's doing. I'm doing it now by having this piece attached to the table that can be used to maintain the state of equilibrium and that force is being transferred to the table. When I hung the weight, that force is being transferred to the other weight, keeping it in place. That's why it's kind of funny. I'm wearing a pair of Levi's right now. And I like Levi's, just so you know. And uh, on the back of every Levi's ever sold is the same patch that they've had since the 1800s. And it's two horses trying to tear apart a pair of Levi's jeans to prove how strong they are. It's on the, the patch. Well, it's, they, their marketing material is trying to fool you into believing that having the two horses pulling in opposite directions on the jeans somehow is the force of two horses acting on the jeans. But the tension on the jeans is just the tension of one horse pulling on the jeans. The other horse is holding the jeans in place. Right? You could have just had a, a pole dug into the ground and had a single horse pulling on the jeans. And you'd accomplish the same thing. You want to impress me, have the two horses pull on the jeans in the same direction and attach it to a pole. Then you'll impress me, because that's two horses trying to pull them, them jeans apart. So when I make my own jean company, that's going to be on my patch. Okay. Um, proton, electron, they are pulled together by an electrostatic force. Uh, I know the charge on each is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So I have the size of the charge on each. I'm asking you to use the Bohr radius because the Bohr radius, although fictitious, not a real radius of an atom, it's something you could have easily looked up. And I'm sure you did. So can you tell me what the separation distance is? Well, I looked it up. It's the Emelian equation. Very nice. I didn't... 5.3 <sighs> e 5.3 to the negative 11th meters. The Bohr radius. Um, so in order to figure out the... Um, the size of the electrostatic force, I'm just going to use a single application of Coulomb's law, and I'll have 1.6 e to the negative 19th. I'm just going to do squared because it's the, it, both charges are the same amount, right? It's a, it's a hydrogen atom, so one proton, one electron. 
uh, then you're going to have k, your 9e to the 9th, all divided by the Bohr radius 5.3e to the negative 11th squared. And how we know this isn't true is actually quite simple. Um, if you work this out, you can set that equal to mv squared over r for the electron, where r is also the Bohr radius, and figure out how fast the electron is going around the atom, which would give you the period of its oscillation. And if you look at its period of oscillation or its frequency, all atoms, all hydrogen atoms would glow at the same frequency all the time, and they don't. So we know it's not doing this, but it's an interesting thought experiment. But that's it. That's the extent of it. It's not more exciting than that. In fact, I'd argue most of this Coulomb stuff isn't that particularly exciting. The Coulomb stuff usually only takes a second. So the hydrogen atom would glow? Well, all things glow based on their temperature. But this would suggest that all, all hydrogen, regardless of its temperature, would glow at the same speed. Or the electron have to be at different locations based on its temperature. And we know that that's not exactly how it works. <coughs> Alrighty.